All right, uh, welcome to week eight of Live Tasting with Appalachian Hunter. Uh, I'm Jeffrey, uh, and this is my channel. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Uh, sorry for the delay in getting this one out. Uh, I wasn't uh, feeling particularly well last week, uh, and it wouldn't have been fair to you, the viewers, or the winemaker, or the wine, to try and taste it when I wasn't feeling uh, 100%. So apologies for that, but... Uh, the good thing is I was excited to taste this as it was and now that I've had an extra week of anticipation I'm even more excited to taste it so um, really looking forward to getting these pink bubbles in my mouth and tasting what they uh, what they can give me <coughs> excuse me uh, for those that don't know uh, I live in Newcastle, uh, in New South Wales, uh, which is sort of the, the gateway to the Hunter Valley. Um, I grew up in Newcastle, uh, never really appreciated what I had with having one of the premier wine regions of Australia and the world just up the road, uh, about a 30 minute drive away. Uh, but during COVID lockdown, I sort of really got bitten by the wine bug and so decided to take a deep dive into the region, the wines, the winemakers, the, the history, and everything that goes along with it. Uh, and so that's where Appalachian Hunter was born. So um, thank you for joining me on this journey. Um, yeah, let's get into it. Um, so today's wine is this one. Now I'm gonna be careful while I pick it up um, more than I normally would be, and I'll explain that in a little while. Uh, so this is it. It's the focus. There we go. Uh, the Summit Pet Nat Rosé from Dirt Candy Wine. Um, there's a lot in that. So let's uh, get into it. Uh, first thing is Pet Nat. What is it? It's a term that I'd heard thrown around. Uh, had no idea what it meant um, so when I sort of picked this one up I'm like okay let's learn what it is so pet nat is like most things in the wine industry uh, from a French term it, uh, and here comes my terrible pronunciation so uh, my apologies up front uh, pet nat is short for Pétillon naturel. Pétillon naturel. Close enough. Um, it's also known as method ancestral. Method ancestral. See, told you, French is terrible. Um, uh, basically, it's the original way for making sparkling wine. Uh, it was discovered by a bunch of French monks uh, in the Lemou area in the south of France in the 16th century um, that if they took the wine stuck it in sealed containers and let it continue fermenting when they opened it there was magically bubbles um, so the other two methods, we'll get back to pet nat in a minute, um, but the other two main methods, uh, you've got what's called method traditionnel or method champenois, uh, which is used uh, in the Champagne region. Now, a lot of people will be very familiar with that. Um, and this is where I didn't know the difference between method ancestral and method traditionnel. Um, but the difference is that with, uh, sorry, I got a really itchy nose. <laughs> um, the um, g'day, Carl. Good to see you again. Um, the difference between method traditional and method uh, natural uh, or ancestral is that the sugar that is used to create the bubbles. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, is naturally occurring in the wine in method ancestral. In method traditional, additional sugar is added to the bottle 
um, to get the bubbles. Um, we'll get into that in a second. The third method is probably the most common. Uh, it's probably one you're all familiar with um, in that you basically take wine and you run carbon dioxide through it and it creates bubbles. So it's essentially like soda stream. Um, you take tap water, you run carbon dioxide through it and you get bubbly water. I'm just wondering whether I can take steel wine and stick it through the soda stream and create bubbly water, bubbly wine. Experiment for later. Right, so a difference between method ancestral and method traditional. Um, as I said, ancestral, they take the wine or the juice from the grapes that they've crushed, they stick it in a bottle. Along with that, there will be some naturally occurring bacteria uh, and yeasts that uh, have been on the outside of the grapes. Uh, it'll go along for a ride with the juice into the bottle. And that's the yeast that does the fermentation that turns the juice, the grape juice, into wine. Um, for those that don't know, fermentation is basically yeast cells, bacteria, uh, chews up sugar, spits out bubbles, carbon dioxide, and spits out alcohol. It then dies and we thank it for a service and congratulations and thank you to all the yeast in the world for bringing us this beautiful alcohol. So. When you do a normal fermentation on a wine, if you do uh, an open vat um, fermentation, so the top, the lid is off, the wine ferments, and then you put it in a bottle, that's how you end up with still wine because all the carbon dioxide evaporates. If you allow the fermentation to continue in the bottle, that's where you get sparkling wine. How that fermentation continues in the bottle is the difference between ancestral and traditional. Um, ancestral just, they take wine that hasn't finished fermenting, they stick it in the bottle, they put the cap on it, and the yeast that's still alive still keeps eating the sugar that's left over in the bottle, uh, and the bubbles gets trapped in the bottle along with the alcohol. Method traditional, what they do is actually it's a second fermentation. They ferment it in an open vat. All the oxygen goes, oh, sorry, all the carbon dioxide goes off. Uh, and the, um, when they put the wine in the bottle, it's all the, the, the yeast is dead and most of the sugar is gone. So what they do is they add extra yeast, they add extra sugar, put the cap on and that's where the second fermentation takes place again oxygen sorry carbon dioxide uh, and alcohol is produced usually uh, when that happens I mean everyone's used to seeing champagne being crystal clear really really bright and clear wine um, kind of like that if you can see it uh, it's very clear um, and that's what we're used to seeing from uh, Champagne Method Traditional because what happens is even though there is that yeast at the bottom of the bottle before it actually gets bottled and sent out to a customer they take the wine out they remove all that they filter it um, so that all that, all that um, yeast is, uh, is gone and you then have this crystal clear sparkling wine it gets put back in a bottle, corked, good to go. With the pet nat, they don't do that. I mean, they can they can filter it uh, in this in exactly the same way, um, but uh, traditionally and in this particular instance with the, this today's pet nat, um, they they don't filter it. 
So, you might be able to see, I don't know whether the camera's going to be able to pick it up, it's, but in the bottom of the bottle there, there is a very fine layer of dead yeast. Um, and on the back, it does say, I'll show you the back here while we're here. It's very cool, very, very nicely laid out. We'll have a look at the label and all the packaging in a minute, but you can see there, unfiltered for best results, invert bottle and serve cloudy. And so what, they, what they're saying there, now you can sort of see this has been sitting in the fridge for about a week. Uh, and so it's all nice and filtered. Uh, there is a sort of haze over the bottle, but that's the uh, condensation because it's just come out of the fridge. Um, yeah, so all that yeast is settled to the bottom uh, and uh, it's going to get stirred up. Um, yeah. So... Where am I? Oh, I've lost myself. <laughs> this is going well. So yeah, here I am anticipating how poorly I'm going to describe the wine. If you watched my uh, uh, previous rosé tasting, um, it didn't go well. And so I'm a little bit perturbed about what's going to happen uh, with this one. So yeah. All right. Anyway. So. I've only showed you the back of the label. Uh, as I said, really, really nicely, clearly and designed. Um, if I can figure out where to show this, there we go. Um, and they actually have a bottle number on it, which I thought was pretty good. Bottle 129. Um, yeah. Um, the label, front label, is very cool. It's called the Summit, and we'll get into the reason why that is in a second. Um, but you just sort of see the purple DC logo there. Um, I think it's very cool. Um, I mean, as a middle-aged white guy, who am I to say what's cool or not? But I think it's cool, and I don't care. And by the rules that The Simpsons taught me, because I don't care, that makes it cool showing my age by throwing out Simpsons restaurants as well so I am what I am um, but I love it I think it's very cool um, that logo I am I can imagine that being splashed all over like a brown leather monogrammed luggage like Blue Vuitton or something very cool um, I mean, the name itself, Dirt Candy, pretty cool. Obviously, it's like candy for adults, wine that comes from the dirt. Like, that's pretty clever. Okay. All right. Showing how uncool I am. But, uh, yeah. Um, I love it. All of the all their bottles have these sort of, these sort of funky designs. Um, the, um, the sort of cursive writing and the um, the images and things it's uh, yeah it's all very cool um, I'm probably not the target market for it uh, I don't know but um, yeah um, I love it I think they've done a really good job and yeah um, let's have a look at the details um, <coughs> you can see there in the top right hand corner <coughs> sorry uh, 2021 um, the varietal is a blend. It's a blend between Shiraz, which is we, what we've tasted a few times, very, very common grape in the Hunter Valley, uh, and something that I don't know whether I've ever tasted before, uh, a German, uh, Austrian, uh, grape called Grüner Feldliner. See the French bad, German bad. Gruner, Gruner Feltliner. Um, right. Now, I've sort of listed that the it comes from the Hunter Valley because Dirt Candy wine is based here in the Hunter Valley, um, but the fruit actually comes from not the Hunter Valley. It uh, comes from 
quite a distance away. Uh, it comes from an area called the New England um, area. Um, let me... I did have a map. Alright. Um, <clears throat> so you can see there, uh, down the bottom here, where the white circle is, that's Picolban. Um, the Hunter Valley. Uh, red marker up the top here is a place called Topper's Mountain Wines. Um, up in the New England area of New South Wales. So northern New South Wales, only probably an hour or so, uh, maybe two up to the border with Queensland. Um, so really starting to get north, but it's at altitude. So I, I should have looked it up, but it's probably about a thousand meters by the time you're getting up there. Um, so it's it's starting to get up. So where you would expect it to be much warmer uh, and more humid as you're sort of getting into subtropical areas. Um, so if you go over to the coast sort of uh, level with uh, where the top of the mountains winds is there, you've got Warbulga and Coffs Harbour. I don't know if you can see that clearly. That's sort of a subtropical um, area and lots of love to all the people up there that's been very very wet uh, there's possibly floods up there I know there is floods up in Lismore so uh, much love to you I uh, hope you're all okay and um, can uh, get to have a glass of wine sometime soon um, but where that location is I mean it's yeah it's subtropical um, but because of the altitude it's much cooler uh, it snows up there occasionally um, yeah, so um, much more German, Austrian sort of uh, weather than you'd associate with Australia. Um, but as you can see, straight line distance, bottom of the chart there, 300 kilometres straight line distance between the two, uh, it's about 187 miles. It's a chunk of distance. Uh, between the two uh, locations. So whilst I sort of say that it's a Hunter Valley wine, <coughs> the fruit actually comes from uh, the New England area, uh, a good chunk up the road. Um, all right. Uh, going through the details, uh, it's quite light wine. I mean, a lot of rosés tend to be, but this is only 12%. Uh, so very much a wine that you can drink and drink and drink and not get totally sozzled. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that, and particularly at lunchtime. It's always a good thing. Um, recommended real retail price uh, is thirty-five dollars Australian uh, at the time uh, of publishing. That's about twenty-six Australian dollars, uh, about twenty-three euro, twenty pounds, about two hundred. 200 to Hong Kong dollars uh, just to give you sort of obviously with taxes and things that'll change um, but uh, yeah um, weigh the bottle uh, 694 grams uh, which is seems basically exactly the same as what um, the weight of the first creek wines uh, that we tasted a few weeks back uh, week uh, 8 I think it was oh no sorry that was week 4 um uh, week eight was the Boydell's um, sparkling Vidello. Uh, it was 200 grams more than this bottle. The reason why we care about bottle weight is that it's one aspect that goes to uh, how environmentally conscious uh, we are with drinking wine. Uh, it's not as simple as uh, less weight in the bottle, the better, but uh, it's one aspect that we look to. Because um, obviously a heavier bottle costs more to make, there's more glass, um, which takes a lot of power, uh, but also the transportation costs, um, recycling, yeah, all those sorts of aspects. Um, so we'd like to sort of just give you an idea of the weight of the bottle. And as you may have seen and noticed, it's a, what they call a crown seal cap. So like a bottle, a uh, beer bottle cap. Uh, it's a very unpretentious, uh, no corks, no capsules, no cages, no foil, nothing. You just whack the cap on and, um, yeah. Speaking of which, it's um, it's time to open it up. Now, um, as you saw on the back of the bottle, 
it says somewhere. Uh, okay, I'm on focus. Open me carefully. Now, on the website, it actually says um, you tip it up to mix all the yummy dead yeast in. Doesn't sound very nice, I know that, but it really does add to the experience as texture, um, as the flavor as well. Um, and it's here it's very common in Australia for anyone that drinks Cooper's beer, um, you know exactly what we're talking about. Basically, you get a bottle of Cooper's, it's quite clear, all well, the sediment on the bottom, you give it a roll on the bar like you're supposed to, mix all that uh, uh, yeast back up into it, and uh, yeah, you get that much tastier, fresher, uh, full-bodied experience. Um, and that's what we're gonna do basically with the wine. Um, but what they do is they sort of say is, <clears throat> on the website, um, open it up and pour it as soon as possible to stop it from um, fizzing over. So I'm gonna try that. I'm hoping that I don't get wine everywhere because I'm really not looking to. Uh, um, so one more time, you can sort of see how nice and clear it is. And then we will do the, I don't know whether you're gonna be able to see it. Not really, the camera's not picking it up, but uh, yeah, it's sort of slowly filtering down into the the wine. Oh, there you go, you can start to see it. It's a brown sort of film. There we go. So just gently, because I don't want to get the bubbles. I don't want to fizz it up. And you can sort of see now, it's gone very cloudy. And I'll wipe that all off. And it's not the condensation, it's the... Uh, so there is a real experience to this. Um, like it's not a matter of opening a cork and cage and that sort of bubbles. It's an entirely different experience. Uh, as you can sort of see, it's still, still quite a bit there. Um, so, I think that'll do. All right, so you can sort of see, quite cloudy. All right, here we go. You can do this off camera. You don't need to have it nice and level on the table. Corkscrew, for those that don't know, most corkscrews have a bottle opener on top. I did not know that. For the longest time, I did not know that. So I'm gonna point it out to anybody that doesn't know. That's what you come here for. Top tips on wine tasting. All right, here we go. Wine glass. Oh, it smells delicious. Well, did not spill anything. I would call that a success. Oh, smells beautiful. Here I did, I had a whole roll of paper towel in preparation, didn't need it. That's a win. <laughs> All right, so there we go, in the glass. As you can see, quite cloudy. And just a real light effervescence. Not a sparkling sort of big bubbles. Just really small, fine effervescence. Mm. All right, let's not get ahead of ourselves. All right. Bring out the tasty, the trusty tasting board. Um, so for those that don't know, when you uh, 
going through your W set level two, and we haven't been doing that, so let's get into that. Um, we've done all that. The rivals are Shiraz and Grine. I love love saying that. Grine without lever. Um, that is a tiny, tiny glass. It is a tiny glass. It's a tasting glass. It's designed for tasting. The be drinking glasses will come out later tonight. Um, all right. So when you're examining a wine using the W set level two grid, the first thing we do is analyze the appearance. For those that don't know, the reason why we use uh, a tasting grid like this it gives us a structure around which to describe a wine. Um, the advantage to that is that if we're using sort of a, a structured approach like this, um, other people who know how that structure works can follow along, can look at what, I, what I've said, even though I'm not particularly good at it, but that's the point, I'm learning, I'm practicing, learning by doing. Um, <clears throat> You, if you can use the grid, you can describe um, in this structured way what the wine is like, then people who also understand that structure will be able to go, oh, maybe it's a wine that I want to try, maybe it's a wine that I don't want to. And more to the point, they've got a point to argue uh, once I've given my description. So, first thing, appearance. We look, white piece of uh, card, and we put the wine up against it and lean it away from yourself uh, and I'll do that down here uh, so this is a, a medium intensity the color is rosé the rosé hue now that's an interesting one so you can sort of see there um, I'm gonna call that a pink orange uh, it's more orange than pink, but I'd say it's not. There's absolutely the pink flow of a color to it. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you can see it, but still, go on focus. There we go. Uh, just really small, light little bubbles. Looks delicious. Um, right. As I said, rose wine. So, what is rose wine? It is neither white nor red, but it is somewhere in between. Um, if you want to deep dive into what a rosé wine is and how they make it, uh, jump back to week, I've got my notes here, week five. Um, the video there, I sort of go into a real deep dive of, to how rosé wine is made, but essentially all juice out of wine grapes, whether it's a red grape or black grape as they're called properly or white grapes the juice is actually clear um, this is something I did not know a color in wine comes from the tannins in the skin uh, of the grape now when you crush the grapes and the juice comes out um, if you just let the juice flow out you're gonna get a white wine even from a red grape or a black grape you're gonna get a white wine if you want the red color, you have to leave the juice sitting with the skins um, and basically the, the tannins, the colors, leach out of the skins into the juice and that's where you get your color. The longer you leave the juice with the skins, the more tannin is going to leach out. Obviously there's only so much that can leach out, um, but um, conversely to that, the shorter amount of time you leave the uh, the skin with the uh, the juice, the less tannin that comes out, the lighter the colour, and so that's where rosé comes through, and that's why you see all manners of different colours of rosés, uh, different intensities, different grapes. Any any red grape can be used to make a rosé. Um, so yeah, uh, it just depends on what the winemaker wants to do. Um, but yeah, go back to week five video, um, go through a full explanation of that. Um, so as you can see, it's sort of this pinky orange color 
Um, so it obviously hasn't spent too long with skin contact. Um, particularly a Shiraz, because a Shiraz is a pretty vibrantly bright red uh, wine usually. Um, so yeah, I'm imagining there's only a couple of hours of skin contact um, to sort of bring out that colour. Um, mm, I gotta smell it. I mean, I can smell it as it is, but as you see, when I'm when I'm swirling, the bubbles come up, the yeast comes up, the cloudiness. Um, while we swirl it, so that allows us to uh, release the um, I can't remember the word now, um, but the the volatile scents compounds that, that, that create the scents allows us to uh, more better discern now I should say my nose is a bit stuffed up at the moment don't know what's going on so I might just quickly bite excuse me <laughs> that's why you come to live stream <laughs> watching someone uh, blow their nose right Hmm. So the the first thing that comes to mind, just strawberries, just delicious fresh red strawberries. Oh. All right. Let's go through our uh, our grid. The nose intensity. I'm gonna say that's a medium, maybe medium pronounced somewhere in the middle there uh, let's go with medium um, as I said I mean the instant reaction when I open the bottle as soon as I open it you can smell it um, it's delicious um, in terms of what I can actually smell um, as I said strawberries that red fruit strawberry um, a bit of raspberry um, maybe even like a like a red grapefruit like a citrusy sort of red fruit mm. um, there is a citrus to it but it's not like a it's not like a, a lemon or a lime it's more an orangey or a ma mandarin Mandarin. Um, there's a, a herbal note to it as well. Um, like a, a grassiness or a, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, See, so, flailing. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, I'll go through the list. Floral. There is a floral note to it. Very, very slight. I think like daisies or something. Uh, no green fruit, no stone fruit. Tropical fruit, black fruit, no, herbaceous. There, there is some sort of herbaceousness to it, like a grass or a. Um, no dried fruit, no spices. No earth notes. Hmm. Alright. Um, before I taste it, I'm going to pause. I'm going to tell you all about the makeup. Uh, so, Dirt Candy Wine, um, as you might expect from the name, uh, not a traditional sort of wine brand name, uh, and it's quite new. So, as I understand it, they've only been running for about four years now, um, and it's a husband and wife team. Uh, Daniel is the winemaker, uh, Jenny is the design guru, I presume it's her uh, genius that came up with the the, the logo and the uh, the design of the, the back of the label as, as I said I, I still really love like that it's so clean um, really really nicely designed 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so husband and wife too. Um, been around for four years, or maybe a little bit longer. Um, but um, Daniel uh, grew up in the Hunter Valley. Uh, has been around wine for a long time. Went off and did something else. Didn't train as a, as a winemaker to begin with. Um, but um, just like Michael Corleone, it's just dragged him back in. <laughs> Um, so I found his passion and, and they've been making some delicious wine. They've won lots of awards, um, the um, Young, wine Wait, Young Winemakers Awards. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, been going great guns. So um, I was lucky enough actually to get in contact with uh, Daniel, the winemaker on Instagram. Um, if you're not following us on Instagram, make sure you do. Uh, I'll send a, there's a link in the chat. Um, there'll be a link in the video description. Um, so I was having a quick chat with him, um, and yeah, um, really, really nice guy. Um, really passionate, obviously passionate about um, his um, his wine making. Um, ah, I'm sorry, I got to taste this. Flavor is still going. Wow. Still going. <laughs> well, I think when we get to the uh, finish part of the grid, we can say it's a long finish because that flavor is still there. Um, I imagine that's probably because of the yeast. Um, but yeah, it's, it sticks around. So, first things first, uh, really, really lightly sparking. Um, you can see the small bubbles, they taste like small bubbles. Um, it's more like a spritz than a, than a really, um, like a soft drink type bubble. Um, very fine. Okay, we'll go through the grid. Um, this is a dry wine, um, and it's much drier than I expected. So particularly all that really s fresh strawberry notes on the nose. I was expecting it to be sweet, and it's not. Like it is, it is really dry. Um, what balances that though is the acidity. So um, acid is what in wine is what gives you that mouth-watering flavors like oh I, I really want to drink some more it's delicious the refreshing aspect to it yeah I'm gonna call that a high acid um, my mouth is just salivating uh, tannin is low um, as you can see I mean it's it's a rosé um, but also in the mouth um, I'm probably a bit confused between the yeast um, and and the tannin. Um, so usually, the way you sort of test the the tannin strength is uh, it, it provides a really drying effect. But because of the um, the high acidity, um, that very much offsets the the, the, the the drying effect of the tannin. Um, yeah, um, I'm struggling to sort of figure out, I mean it's low, but, um, so trying to differentiate on the palette the different elements. And this is just sort of showing my inexperience with this sort of stuff with A with rose wine, B with um, 
a wine that still has yeast in it. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the way to describe that is if you're used to having like a, a lager and then you have an ale, the, like the, the cloudy sort of ales, uh, or as I said, Cooper's uh, Pale Ale, um, it's, it's that difference. Like, I mean, it's very different sort of experience and not something that I've ever had. So what I was interested to see is once you've finished a glass, is there actually any sediment or film or anything? And as you can see, it doesn't appear to have left anything. So it's obviously very fine, the, uh, the yeast. And, um, and you can sort of see here now, it's starting again to settle. Um, a little lash at this. You can see it's nice and bubbly with the head. Very fine bubbles. Um, Yeah, obviously, because I had that out for a little while and was swirling quite a bit to do the nose, um, the bubbles had, had escaped, but as a fresh pour, much more. But still really fine. Like, it's it's obviously a sparkling wine, but, um, yeah, like a really, really fine, very refined. I, I like it. Um, alcohol is low. I know it's only 12%, but um, you can barely taste. Like, I mean, it, it's the sort of wine you could easily sit there and just drink and just not even realizing you're drinking wine. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, that's what I'm doing there. Uh, just breathing out from the back of the throat. Um, any sort of burning sensation can uh, indicate alcohol. Um, no, no, not there. Body. Um, so this is a hard one, I'm, and this is the bit that I was sort of not looking forward to. So I know there's the yeast in there. It gives that cloudy effect. Does that actually translate to mouthfeel? Yes, I think so. But with the bubbles as well, um, like how to judge that? Um, I mean, it's much, I'm gonna call it a medium. Um, and it, because there's a weight in the mouth it feels in your mouth much more than say like a Pinot Grigio or something like that um, but it's not like a a full body red or anything like that and it's it's different to um, like a champagne style sparkling wine um, <clears throat> whereas it's got large bubbles and sort of fills up your mouth with, with bubbles this whilst it fills your mouth it's it's more wine than than, than bubbles. Um, flavor intensity, um, I'm going to call it pronounced. Like it's 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 not holding back. Um, like there is there is a lot going on in there. Um, we'll get into the actual taste. Um, absolutely that those strawberries that red fruit um, there's also I think that that call with the red grapefruit is spot on um, um, I 
but there is an earthiness to it um, like a not earth rock like a flint or a slate or something like that um, yeah uh, and don't get me wrong it's delicious it's not like I'm licking a piece of slate um, it's it's really nice um, raspberries and there's something else in there um, I think it's probably that herbal note that I can't sort of place um, yeah like it's so this is the first I think, as I said it's the first time A I've tried a pet nap um, first time I've had a wine with the yeast still in it um, and first time I've had Gruner so there's a, there's a lot of firsts in there so I don't know which parts of it that are, I mean there's a lot of unfamiliar um, so when I was doing my research I picked up my trusty copy of the Wine Folly Master Guide Magnum Edition excellent resource if you're trying to learn anything about wine absolutely essential um, like it's colors and infographics and and really really easy to digest but really really good depth of knowledge as well um, so like a chapter on each of the grapes of primary grapes um, yeah uh, so as you can see I was looking at the Gruner page last night um, ah there you go um, so their notes that they sort of provide is yellow apple pear asparagus it could be asparagus because I don't eat asparagus um, so but I, I do cook it because the wife likes it so um, that could be what I'm sort of tasting and smelling that's unfamiliar and they say flint as well so I'll learn one day. Um, so, I do love what they say. They say, Austria's most important wine is produced in a myriad of styles. So, Halla al mein Funden und Österreich. Yeah. That's the limit of my German, and it wasn't even good. So, hello to all my friends from Austria. Uh, that's Austria, not Australia. Österreich, as opposed to Australia. Um, yeah. Um, well worth it. So yeah, that asparagus. That I, I think that may be what I'm. That that herbal note that I'm sensing that I just can't place. Um, and another glass. So I'm going to say this. It's it's a it's a bold taste. Um, I mean, go back and watch my initial reaction, and it's both the smell and the taste. It's bold. It's not um, what you're going to be uh, imagining. Everyone is going to enjoy. And I'm going to say that right up front. Um, I love it. Um, it's not something I've ever tried, and I'm really glad I have. Um, but there'll be people who won't enjoy that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. There we go. I think I'll leave the uh, last word to the winemaker. As I said, I was in contact with Daniel. Uh, on uh, Instagram, sort of asking about the wine. Was there anything I needed to know about it before I tasted it? Um, and he was explaining, and I think the quote is here somewhere. Uh, where is it? Uh, oh, I've lost my lost my notes. 
There's the. Uh, uh, I like to keep my pet gnats as simple as possible and try to stay as true to the origin as possible and capture the fermentation freshness in the bottle. Um, and I think he's done that. Like, it's. Um, yeah. You know that this is. This is wine. It's, it's not some filtered, crystallized. Um, yeah, I like it. Um, it's, as I said, there'll be people who won't. Um, uh, I'm interested to give this to my wife. I'm pretty sure she's not going to like it. Um, she prefers a sweeter and um, more fruity style of wine. Um, but the strawberry spot winner. So I don't know. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll give that a, a tasting tonight with her and to see what she's got to say. Um, yeah. Um, interesting. Really interesting wine. Congratulations, Daniel. If you watch this, um, yeah, fascinating wine. Really, really glad that I've tried that. Um, they've got quite a range, <clears throat> so check out their uh, their range. I don't know. This is the first of their wine that I've tried, um, uh, but I will be trying more. Uh, I'll absolutely be going to visit them next time I'm up in the valley and uh, checking out the rest of the range. Um, but if this is anything to go by, I look forward to it. Um, there's um, a lot in this, but I like it. So, um, yeah. Um, let's just check the chat. No questions? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> here you go. Another tasting done. Another rosé tasting done. One day, I'll look back on these videos and cringe at how badly I could... With, was it describing a rosé wine so um, yeah dirt candy wine the summit 2021 focus pet nut rosé Shiraz Gruna I love saying that Gruna um yeah pick up a bottle or give it a try if you uh, see it uh, buy a glass somewhere although I'd be very surprised if you do um, <clears throat> yeah it's um, very tasty um, next week uh, I'm excited to say that we actually have we've taken Appalachian Hunter to the next level um, by that I mean we have our first sponsored tasting um, so if you follow us on Instagram or follow me on Instagram you may have seen that last week I was meant to play golf uh, up in the Hunter Valley at Crown Plaza um, about we had rain leading up to it but apparently the course was still open um, about an hour before we were supposed to tee off it absolutely flogged down with rain so uh, yeah they cancelled it and I was like Huh, here I am already stuck in the Hunter Valley, can't play golf. How can I possibly entertain myself? So sure enough I went to a wine tasting. Um and I got the call just as I was going past a winery that I'd always wanted to stop into but never actually done, and so I just sort of pulled the handbrake on, slid the car in on the wet Okay. That may not be exactly how it happened, but just work with me here. Uh, and so I went to Sobel's Wines um, and it's a really funky building uh, always sort of said oh, I want to go there one time glad I stopped in I got a private tasting uh, and uh, because there was nobody there uh, <laughs> and I got to spend some time chatting with the uh, the winemaker Edgar there um, and at the end of it he sort of said look here have a bottle of my newest creation so this is the Sobel's Shiraz Cabernet. Uh, come on, there we go. Um, 
So he said, if you do a live tasting on this, you can have a bottle. Um, so thank you to Edgar at Soval's Wines. Uh, I'll be tasting that next week, live, or next Wednesday. Um, I promise to you, my viewers, that I will give you my honest opinions. Uh, the fact that it was given to me will not sway my opinion. Um, so that's my contract with you, my dear viewers, uh, to give you my honest opinion, uh, no matter who's paying for the wine. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, no more questions? No. Um, thank you for joining me. Have a great week and uh, come back next week and uh, we'll uh, check out this one. And uh, if you see this anywhere, pick a bottle and give it a try. Let me know what you think. Um, thanks very much, guys. See you next week.